Okay, well, uh, today's topic, uh, as I mentioned, would be the spiritual discipline of Christian meditation. I specifically mentioned Christian meditation because uh, uh, it's amazing that there are many, many kinds of meditation and uh, it is necessary for us to make that distinction, I guess. And as we go along, I'm sure you will see that uh, the distinctions come out uh, quite, uh, quite clearly. All right. Now, as we talk about meditation, here is another discipline, which I think um, causes some, some bit of difficulty for, for, I would say, a number of people. You know, uh, along with fasting, I think we discussed fasting uh, some time back. Meditation also, uh, you know, one of those difficult disciplines because we keep uh, wondering how exactly is it done? Because there are so many different ways of uh, people doing, uh, what do you say, uh, meditation. Uh, some might wonder what are, uh, how do I get the benefit of meditation? Do I can can I really feel the difference after meditation? So there is some ambiguity there, and that's the reason why I say, along with fasting, maybe meditation is one of those that is uh, uh, one of those difficult spiritual disciplines. You know, it's easier to do study, it's easier to do prayer, uh, fellowship, but meditation is maybe a little bit on the you know difficult side. Now, some people might even wonder if it is actually a waste of time because, uh, because you know, they find, may find it difficult to keep their mind focused or mind still. Uh, they might find it difficult to concentrate. They are constantly distracted. And so to do meditation for any period of length of time, for some people, it may be difficult. And so they might wonder, uh, maybe there is no benefit in this. But, you know, actually, as we talk about meditation, uh, I was just wondering that involuntarily, uh, we are, all of us are actually doing it in one way or the other for whatever length of time we are able to, right? The reason I say that is because, you know, every time we, you could say, contemplate, every time you think deeply, Every time we spend time on reflection or reflecting on something that is important, every time, and I'm using you know, words that hopefully we are familiar with, every time we ponder, every time we imagine, I would tend to conclude that that is a meditative process, right? So in one way or the other, we are indulging in meditation even though sometimes we don't consciously know it, right? I have to show all of us uh, like to take some time out, uh, some time uh, just to relax. Uh, and, you know, some people would like to do that more often than others, perhaps. And so uh, when we do that, we might be actually indulging or involving ourselves in some kind of a meditative process. So even though sometimes we consciously don't do it, but involuntarily sometimes we are engaging in some kind of a meditative process. Okay, having said that, let me just mention uh, some where the different types of meditation, and then we will get into a little bit of our interaction uh, just to get your experience of it. When I was uh, looking at uh, you know the different types of meditation, I was actually surprised that there are so many different kinds of meditation. Now, many of it can be variations of the same, but nevertheless, they are given sp specific names. And the reason they are giving specific names is because they, they tend to, uh, what do you say? They tend to highlight some aspect which is slightly different from all other types of meditation. For example, let me just uh, uh, you know, mention some of the types of meditation that I've come across, you know, through uh, the little reading I've done. Have you heard of Zen meditation? You know, uh, that is something which is, I think, of course, close to Buddhist, Buddhist type of meditation. Uh, they also talk about a mantra or a yoga meditation. 
Now, the reason they distinguish between the two is because one is focused on the mantra, the other is focused maybe on your breathing. But uh, that is a type of meditation that people indulge in. Transcendental meditation is something that uh, we have all heard of, you know, TM, they, they, they call it, it's a, it's a trademarked you know, uh, abbreviation, I guess. Then there is Vipassana med meditation. There is Chakra meditation. There is Qigong meditation, which is Chinese in origin. And I am presuming that this is something that uh, maybe the, you've heard of the group Falun Gong. They would probably practice some this type of meditation. Then there is sound bath meditation, which includes certain types of sounds and you in, you know, in a, type, a, 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 spe a special type of environment. And so these are the different types of meditative processes that uh, people engage in. Now, these may be some of it you may have heard of, uh, but there are some less uh, known meditations. And let me mention some of those. Uh, have you heard of mindfulness meditation? There is something called movement meditation, progressive relaxation meditation, loving kindness meditation, and visualization meditation. Now, these are all various, you know, focused on various, uh, what do you call it, practices or, or focused on some aspects of the human, human experience so that they call them different types of meditations. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned to you that many of these could be, uh, you know, variations of the same. Uh, but there is some, uh, but there are some distinctions to each one of those. Now, I haven't mentioned to you Christian meditation. Now, some people would specifically want to call the kind of meditation that the scriptures talk about and what Christians may involve in as Christian meditation. They want to distinguish it from all other kinds of meditation, and hence uh, the term uh, Christian meditation. So today, I hope that uh, you know our discussion will deal with the structure and outcomes of Christian meditation. And obviously, I'm going to use that same term just to keep it distinct from all others. All right. Uh, I will make some uh, comments about. Uh, you know, the contrast between Eastern and Christian. Uh, but before we do that, um, I'm sure you, through your long years of uh, in the faith, uh, I'm sure you have engaged in some kind of meditation. Uh, what is your experience that you have had of, uh, of meditation? Did any one of you, or can you identify specific benefits that you get from meditative processes that you've involved yourselves in? So once again, I'm trying to focus on your experience. So could you, would you like to share what you have experienced in terms of this meditative process? Okay. Somebody has to go first. So yes, Vanessa, go ahead. Okay, I've, I've been to this uh, Vipassana, Vipassana meditation camp. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, Go ahead. In, one of the, in, in one of the schools, the director, he goes for this meditation camp, this Vipassana one. So he had uh, given me a place and I had gone and it was uh, a 10-day uh, meditation camp where you're not allowed to have your mobile phones and you're not allowed to speak to anyone. And it was mostly meditation sit for hours and, and just keep quiet and just meditate. And I, I didn't like it at all. I mean, when I was sitting quietly, then I was, of course, my mind was thinking of something else. It was, it was not, a, um, I don't know, meditation of the soul or what it was, but I didn't understand anything. So I didn't gain anything by it. So after that, I didn't go for any more meditation camps. Okay. Okay. Uh, was it, was it, uh, uh, meditate, I mean to say, was it individual? In other words, was it in a group or was it individually group. done? Group, group, it was a group. Right. A okay. big hall, a big hall, and many people, many, 
gents were one side and uh, I mean males were one side and females were one side. So it was okay. a huge campus. Uh, okay, all right. So you you specifically say that you found no particular uh, from it. No, right. nothing at all. Okay, all right. Thank you, Vanessa. Anybody else have any thoughts on your experience? Kona, I'm sure, I'm sure you have been doing some kind of meditation. <laughs> uh, no? <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, Surimurti, go ahead. Uh, uh, do unmute yourself, Surimurti, when you speak. Yeah. I have never set aside, set aside a time for meditation. Okay. I think meditation means to think deeply. That is the meaning of meditation. But okay. There are times when I am alone. The mind automatically begins to think on various things. Most of the time it gets connected to the scriptures or God. For example, railway station, waiting for train, nobody is near you. You are not. You are not talking to anybody. The mind begins to wander. But mostly, it wanders towards the scriptures or God. Okay. I think uh, that is the only time when I am alone. I begin to think of so many things, and the percentage of thinking towards God is more. I mean, that is the only way I meditate. I never set aside. A particular time. That is my experience. Okay. Thank you, Suryamurthy. I think uh, you seem to uh, you seem to have more of an involuntary meditation, right? Rather than making it very structured, you are doing it more. Uh, you know, it comes naturally. That yes. seems to be what you are saying. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Bertie, go ahead. Please unmute yourself. I would go along with Surya Murthy. You know, uh, never, never was able or never took, like, you know, said I could, uh, you know, let me now meditate, you know, deeply uh, about the scriptures about God. But uh, my experience is same as Surya Murthy. Okay, right, right. Once again, uh, uh, you did not uh, structure it the way some people actually do, and many Christians do that. Yes. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Suryamurthy, go ahead. Uh, if, I, uh, if I remember correctly, Isaac was moving in the fields, isolating. When Rebecca arrived, uh, are you able to recollect that? Um, Isaac. Sorry. Yeah, sorry about the law of Abraham. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, just can you repeat what you said? Uh, are you able? Isaac. Yes. Was moving in the fields. And I think the Bible says right. he was meditating. Yes, yes. So he was. At the time when Rebecca arrived. Yes. So, just he was walking alone and he began to meditate. Right. In fact, I do have a reference to that and maybe we will uh, talk a little bit more about that. But yes, that is, there is the word used there is uh, in a process of meditation. Right. Anybody else can, would like to share your uh, your personal experience in the discipline of meditation? Uh, Sikinder, uh, I think you want to say something. If you you need to unmute yourself. 
I want to have a clear picture of meditation. What meditation is, and uh, the definition and the explanation. What you want to pinpoint about meditation? That's okay. <laughs> that should that shows that uh, you know so many of us are struggling to really understand this whole process, right? Like I said, uh, like fasting, it is sometimes a little. It's a, it's a, it's a concept that is a little difficult uh, to understand its spiritual intent. But anyway, hopefully, I'll give it a try. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, so looks like many of you are in the same boat <laughs> in terms of uh, probably not having uh, much to say about meditation. Right. <laughs> Any takers before I? Discuss a few thoughts. <laughs> okay, maybe you will have more thoughts to share when I when I complete. So let's uh, then let me just share with you some uh, what do you call it? Uh, some points that I was able to uh, gather from the scriptures and uh, uh, and also uh, make some distinctions. Okay, let's first talk about you know, uh, the distinction. You know, when, when meditation is mentioned, many of us will uh, uh, automatically gravitate towards the Eastern type of meditation, right? Uh, we, uh, we can uh, think of somebody who is sitting very quiet in a particular posture, uh, maybe eyes closed, uh, you know, hands stretched out in a particular way, uh, and a deep, deep, you know, uh, in some kind of thought. Uh, and some of the meditation, med, med, uh, med, meditation I mentioned earlier, uh, probably could be classified more as Eastern, or now you can also use the word New Age. This New Age phenomenon has sort of uh, imbibed a lot of, or it, there's a lot of syncretism in the uh, uh, this this uh, understanding, uh, they use various uh, uh, you know thoughts from all kinds of philosophies, and that's why it is called the new age. But uh, if I can get into the distinction, um, Eastern meditations seem to have one particular goal. Uh, not now, not all of them may not, but most of them want to achieve this or to become one with the universe or one with divinity, right? So they will go into a process where we, we would call it emptying the mind. They, they empty their mind through various exercises. It could be focusing on a particular word or a mantra, or a breathing process. Uh, one particular Zen meditator said that they are asked to uh, uh, focus on the sound made by a one-hand clap. Right? That's what exactly he said. Uh, focus on the sound made by a one-hand clap. Now, I'm wondering if there will be any sound. But when you're focused to find the sound, you go into deep, uh, what do you call it, concentration, right? But the, the, uh, the goal seems to be you need to empty your mind. When you, and when you do this repeatedly, uh, you slowly move into uh, an out-of-body experience. They, that this, these are words that are used by some of these people who explain it this way. Uh, they detach themselves from the illusory world, the world that they live in, many of them believe are Ill, uh, is only an illusion. And you need to extract, extricate yourself from this illusion, right? And uh, where all sense of duality ceases to exist. Duality means uh, there is nothing like you and me. There's nothing like universe and me. There's nothing like God and me. We all merge into one, right? And uh, that is called maybe by the Buddhist as enlightenment. 
maybe it is called nirvana or a, an experience of nirvana by more of the uh, Hindu type of uh, meditative processes. But you calm the mind. You experience a very calm mind. And you, they say, reach a heightened level of spiritual awareness. All right. So this is the process and the goal of Eastern meditation, where you do not allow your mind to be thinking about anything. You need to cease thinking. You have to stop the thinking process. The cognitive process must be uh, completely uh, stopped so that you can then experience this a uh, higher heightened sense of spiritual awareness all right and uh, i do have uh, a neighbor of mine and uh, uh, i would think anil and rika i'm not sure both of you have met him but uh, he does this type of meditation and he many times says that he he's not aware when he goes into this trance like state you know it's a trance like state of mind where he is not even aware of time. He is not aware of his body. He is not aware of himself. Everything merges into some kind of a uh, new, uh, you know, thoughtlessness, right? So that is how uh, he explains it, right? So the uh, Eastern meditation seem to focus on disengaging the mind. And now let me come to Christian meditation. While Christian meditation seem to do slightly the opposite, you know. Now it, the Christian meditation also have a calm mind. I mean, uh, we also want to uh, reach a level of focused concentration, but we do not talk about emptying the mind. You know? From the Christian perspective, we don't talk about emptying the mind. We want to fill the mind. Uh, it's a very different from the Eastern type. The Eastern type is empty, but Christian meditation is filling the mind with thoughts related to biblical passages or Christian devotion. And that is perhaps one of the uh, you know, fundamental differences. In other words, Christian meditation wants to experience God, right? The difference between experiencing God and being God, thinking you are God, that is the Eastern type meditation where you don't see a difference with you and God. But Christian meditation is where you, uh, where divinity becomes real for you. The creation becomes a blessing rather than illusory, right? Uh, the creation for us is not illusion, but it is real in, in, in one sense, and you see it as a blessing rather than only an illusion. So many would like to term Christian meditation as transformative, right? Uh, Christian meditation is a kind of listening, a heightened sense of listening, sensing, and heeding the life and light of Jesus Christ, as somebody put it. Christian meditation gives us the wondrous and glorious opportunity to dwell completely on the goodness and perfection of, the, of our Lord. See, so once again, notice how we are making that distinction. There is a focused attention on uh, somebody, you know, and that, that is the goodness and the perfection of our Lord. Maybe if I can bring a Trinitarian perspective here. Uh, I would like to say Christian meditation is a relational interaction with our triune God, right? It's a deliberate entering into a relationship, right, uh, with God. To see yourself from God's perspective rather than the words. So how can we make the contrast? I'd like to just bring three thoughts there just to make the contrast between Eastern and Christian meditation. Christian or uh, Eastern meditation focuses on calming the mind, experience, experiencing a sense of calm to the extent where you cease to think, you suspend your cognitive uh, process. But Christian meditation 
is an insightful process where you are actually allowing yourself to gain further insight rather than just a calm mind. So that is one distinction I'd like to make. Secondly, I think it is very obvious. Eastern uh, meditation is more emptying of the mind, while Christian meditation is filling of the mind. And a third distinction I'd like to make is the Christian meditation, or rather Eastern meditation is more trance-like experience, where you might not even understand and know where you are or what time it is. You lose all sense of the three-dimensional world. Right? That is the that is the Eastern, uh, uh, the goal of Eastern meditation. While Christian meditation is very conscious, you do not lose consciousness. You remain conscious, and you know what uh, is taking place. Right. So those are the three distinctions I'd like to make from Eastern and Christian meditation. Let me give you some more thoughts on Christian meditation. Christian meditation is a way of you could say communing with God, or it's a communion with God. Once again, I bring in a Trinitarian perspective. Just as Father, Son, Holy Spirit commune with each other, the Father, Son, the Father knows the Son, the Son knows the Father, the Holy Spirit is the glue that brings them in that sense of knowing. There is a con there is a constant communion going on. So Christian meditation is more in the sense of communion, right? And it could be done through the focus of scripture, focusing on scripture uh, and God's presence with us. Now, the scriptures for, for Christian meditation is very important. You probably notice that our thoughts tend to be focused very much on scripture. In fact, I don't know if uh, it is the Essenes, but there is a group of people uh, Christians uh, who called the Bible the scroll of meditation. <laughs> they term it the scroll of meditation. In other words, they are meant for, uh, you know, for us to enter a process of meditation. So, once again, Christian meditation uh, uh, literally is the idea of pondering, dwelling on, and you could say some use the word mutter the scriptures, <laughs> muttering, you know, uh, or rather uh, explicit talking or saying or expressing the scriptures uh, so that it begins to take root in our, in our hearts. Now, uh, as Christianity progressed from the first century on into the second, there was a, 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 an interesting practice that many Christians began at that time. And it is in, in the Latin, it is called uh, Lecto Divina. I don't know if you've heard of it, uh, but it, it became a very structured way of meditating. And uh, many believe it is one of the earliest forms of Christian meditation. Like I said, it was developed in the second and third centuries. It is Lecto Divina is Latin for divine reading divine reading, or spiritual reading, or holy reading. And they read scripture in a way to promote communion with God and provide special spiritual insights. So uh, the early Christians started this process or this concept called Lecto Divina, divine reading, specifically to uh, allow themselves to have a deeper communion with God and to have access to special spiritual insights. And of course, this was more uh, practiced by the monks and many of the monks, you know, the whole order of monks started because uh, many Christians were getting distracted by the day-to-day -day, you know, life uh, circumstances. And some of these people, some of them decided that they don't want these distractions. So they started monasteries and that's where the monks uh, began the process of uh, uh, doing these kinds of meditation. And they would spend, you know, days praying and reading scripture. And while they were reading, remember I said the meaning is divine reading. While they were reading, phrases 
or verses seem to leap off the page with special personal importance. And that's the reason why uh, uh, divine reading is done many times. It is repeated. You read it once, you read it a second time, you read it a third time, then you reflect on it. And sometimes you are given some spiritual insight as you do that reading. Now, this became, of course, later on, uh, you know, a, a very strong practice within the Catholic faith. Uh, they, uh, the Catholics adopted this process over the centuries, and then it became uh, very much part of their uh, practice. Now, uh, Electro, Electro Divina is now actually criticized by some. <laughs> uh, some of the more uh, contemporary Christian scholars, some of them think that Electro Divina is not necessarily Christian, but it is actually ancient Greek meditation, right? And they say it is not Christian because it was not found in the early Christian church. But I'm not sure if they are uh, probably re reacting a bit too much to the extreme. Uh, I would think that there is still tremendous amount of benefit by doing divine reading. I mean, the term divine reading just means reading it again and again so that you are able to understand the context and, uh, you know, some, some sense of spiritual understanding and insight you gain. Uh, so uh, once again, we won't get into that controversy at this time. Just wanted to mention to you that some scholars don't advocate uh, Lecto Divina. Okay. Now, what I want to do is, in the little remaining time, I want to go to some scriptures. Uh, once again, let's take some things out of the scriptures. I'll read you a few scriptures, and then we can put this and, and then make some conclusions. Let me read to you what uh, Surya Murti was referring to, Genesis chapter 24, and in verse 63. Uh, this is uh, in context with Isaac, if you remember, uh, uh, Abraham wanted a bride for Isaac and he had sent servants to find the bride. And, um, and of course, the, word, the chapter describes how that wife was found, and that was Rebecca. But in verse 63, let me read it for you. It says, he, that is Isaac, went out to the field one evening to meditate. Uh, and as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. And you know, the camels were coming with his potential bride. Um, but here, the word, he went out to, into the field one evening to meditate. The word meditate, uh, some scholars uh, indicate uh, the Hebrew word used there is suak, uh, which means muse. Uh, it could have fun a fundamental meaning of meditate. But some feel it has a bit of a negative connotation. It could mean maybe a complaint, right? Uh, uh, is some sort of some form of lamenting. Now, I don't know the circumstances under which Isaac may have been lamenting. Maybe he was also very concerned. He was wondering whether he'll get a wife or not, or he'll stay a, or he will he be a lifelong bachelor. Uh, maybe he was uh, concerned for that, and there was some sort of a lamenting going on. But the Hebrew can also mean. Thoughtfulness, it could indicate thoughtfulness. He was being very thoughtful, right? Now, the reason we pick up this uh, particular verse is because, you know, notice Isaac was seeking the Lord during his time of meditation, all right? And he was doing it at a time when he was concerned, maybe going through a moment of, uh, you know, trouble, or uh, maybe he had troubled thoughts. Uh, and so, he was seeking the Lord when his mind was troubled. Uh, so it seemed to indicate that meditation may also take the form of lament. Right? Uh, so meditation is not just necessarily, uh, you know, just feeling happy or uh, just calming the mind. It could also have some kind of, what you say, pouring out your heart uh, in a form of lament or a complaint. So the Bible seemed to indicate meditation as a very, very thoughtful process. That's the reason why we keep saying uh, the, 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 the filling of the mind is part of Christian, uh, you know, the Christian meditation. 
Let me read to you Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, uh, and we'll pick up some thoughts from there. Uh, in verse 8, Joshua 1, it says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Now, I'm sure you this is probably one of the more popular verses used in terms of meditation, <coughs> right? Uh, what does it say? Uh, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, all right? And that's the reason why uh, this word muttering, muttering, you know, constantly having the word of God on your lips. And I don't know if you know, uh, you know, you probably have seen some of the Jews do that. Uh, have you seen when they read the scriptures, what do they do? They're constantly shaking their heads. <laughs> Uh, so they are muttering the scriptures. It's uh, right. And, and Joshua says that you shall meditate on it day and night. So, uh, and this is also uh, reciprocated by David in the Psalms. The Psalms also talk about meditating on the law day and night. So what does Joshua mean by that? What can we understand from that? Maybe what Joshua or David or some of the others who mentioned this, what they're really saying is that you uh, soak yourself in scripture. You immerse yourself in scripture so much that it becomes part of your heart, right? It goes deep into your heart. The words of God, in other words, should not depart from you. We must be constantly soaked in scripture so that we derive its inspiration, we get its guidance, and it's a lamp unto our feet. So that is perhaps one of the reasons why meditation is done. And that is a very powerful, interesting part of Christian meditation, right? That's why the scriptures are very important for Christians in Christian meditation. So what was the intention? The intention was that the word of God penetrate into our very beings. And from a new covenant perspective, from a Trinitarian perspective, I think that it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Because what is God's perspective for us or what is God's goal for us? God wants that we be bonded to him, that we experience a sense of intimacy with him, a communion that, uh, a communion and a union that, that heightens our relational experience of God. That's the reason why the incarnation is so important for us. Jesus Christ came in the incarnation so that he could be joined to us. He would take on our flesh. And so all of this seemed to indicate the intention being a very close communal sense of oneness, right? Oneness. So meditation for Christians is a way of deriving and moving towards that sense of communion and experience that sense of oneness where we enjoy the Trinitarian reality uh, together as the body of Christ. Let me read to you Psalm 1914, a few more scriptures and then uh, we will uh, quickly get into some discussion. Psalm 1914 says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is another very familiar verse for all of us. I hear many of you pray like this. <laughs> you know, we pray that let my meditations of my heart be acceptable, right? I've heard that many a times. But notice one thing interesting, isn't it? Meditations of the heart. Have you stopped and wondered what that could mean? To me, it is an obvious reference to something that is a conscious activity. Yes, it's a, it's a, you meditate in your mind, but it reaches your heart, right? And uh, it, it then, uh, your, your uh, experience of God comes from your very heart, right? From the very depth of your being. So the meditation of your heart is basically referring to uh, a relational reality from the very depth of our being with God Almighty, right? So it's a cognitive process. It is a process where there is a sense of awareness. It is not a mental blanking, blanking of the mind, 
It is not blanking out the mind or emptying the mind. It is a, 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 a cognitive uh, process of a heightened, of a, of a sense of awareness. Acts 4.25, let me read, read you two more scriptures. Acts 4.25 says, uh, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? Yeah, here the apostle is talking about, um, you know, he's, he has that long speech and uh, he's talking about how, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the Gentiles uh, sort of rebelled and were against them. Now, I just wanted to pick up one word there. You know, notice it says, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and plot? People plot in vain. The word plot there is the Greek word, uh, imiliti san, I think it is. That's how, I'm not sure how, that's how it's pronounced. But the word plot in Acts 4.25 has a connection or a connotation of meditating or meditation. It indicates a devising or a contriving. You are devising a plot. You're contriving a plot, right? And so here, once again, notice how the word meditate is being used or the root word there is meditation. Uh, how is it being used? It can be used for good or for bad. You can meditate for doing evil and you can meditate for doing good. You can derive benefit from the meditation or you can derive evil from meditation. Now, or in, in, in any case, it is a very strong uh, me, uh, you know, cognitive process, right? It is a deliberate cognitive process. So that is how the Bible uses the word meditation. And one more scripture, Philippians chapter four and verse eight, it says, finally, brethren, Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, uh, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good, good report, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Another familiar verse, Philippians 4 verse 8, meditate on these things. The apostle here is very clearly indicating uh, that we determine what we meditate on and very clearly, it is talk, talking about what we need to meditate on. Things that are noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, praiseworthy. These are the things we meditate on. Right? So uh, Paul is urging a, a meditative process, which is once again a cognitive process. So what is our conclusion now? Just having gone through very briefly uh, some of the scriptures that talk about meditation. Uh, one, it is meditate. Christian meditation is a communion with God and to be aware of his presence with us. That's one point I would like to mention. Secondly, to know and experience God's attributes, including his love, kindness, and grace, making them more tangible realities in our lives. That's why I said Christian meditation is transformative. Right? It transforms us as we meditate on the attributes of God, which is love, kindness, grace, and of course, you can mention all the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Christian meditation is to transform our thoughts and filling of our minds with biblical truths, bringing our thoughts into agreement with God's thoughts. All right, So we are aligning our thought process with how Jesus Christ would think. And uh, Thirdly, or fourthly, to deepen our knowledge of Jesus Christ and thus our devotion, obedience to him as our Lord, right? So it deepens our experience and knowledge of our Lord, even as the Apostle Paul, uh, Peter says, to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Psalm 119.11 says, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you, right? Your word have I hidden in my heart. Could that be a meditative process, right? Uh, uh, it, 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 that maybe can be done through a meditative process. And when it says that I might not sin against you, take sin in the broader sense. It's not just 
uh, law breaking, but to be close to God, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to have a sense of confidence in the presence of God, right? Uh, and so uh, these are some just some thoughts that uh, I just wanted to share with you. Okay. Um, let me then end with one quotation. Uh, I found this in a tweet. <laughs> uh, and I don't know the author of this, but I'll just mention it to you. It says, the methods of meditation and I'm presuming it is Christian meditation, are paths to travel to arrive at the encounter with Jesus. But if you stop on the road, you will make a God out of the path. So meditative, meditation is not an end in itself, but it is to help us reach something which is very uh, dear to us. And that is, of course, you can say, simply put, our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to stop there. And I will let you now make some comments, or if you should have any questions, feel free to ask. Surimurti, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, do unmute yourself. Uh, do unmute yourself, Surimurti. You are quoting some verses from. Joshua and David, where uh, the Bible uses the words, the law. See, the, 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 the law is not the correct translation in these places and in hundreds of other places. Uh, you can easily verify it from any interview here. Uh, I'm, aware, I'm sure that many of you people know what is what is an interview here. In interview here, you can find out what was the original word used in those places. The original word used in those places is Torah. Torah refers to the five books of Moses. So the word law, whenever they have translated in English as law, it hides the meaning. The original word is Torah. This is a deliberate mistranslation by the English translators. So this you can easily verify from any interlinear. Uh, if I can just uh, go back to that quotation from Joshua chapter 1, uh, the actual the reading is, this book of the law, it says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. So that is the... That is the, the correct, uh, correct translation should have been book of the Torah. Why, why, why the King James people have always hidden this meaning? Most of the places, in hundreds of places, even in the Psalms, wherever the word law is used, the original word is Torah. So they should not have missed the mystery. Okay, I mean, uh, that may be a very technical point, but uh, I don't know. No, if... very, it is very easy. Yeah. You take in any interlinear. Go to that particular verse, you will find that the original word used is Torah. Yeah, but uh, but I think uh, our understanding is that it is referring to the books, the, the entire books. It's not just referring to, I'm not sure when you say law, if it is just specific uh, law statements. But wherever, no, wherever they have translated the word as law, in most of the places, the correct word is Torah. See, the entire Old Testament was divided by the Jews into three sections. The law, the prophets, and the writings. So the law yes. is five books of Moses. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mean, I always taken it as that. And even, and even Jesus says that the law and the prophets talk about him. 
So I think there is no confusion there. I'm not sure if there was any. No, the, there is. There is. There is definitely confusion. Oh. Because okay. when 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 they have used the word Torah, they say they are translating Torah. Yeah, it but I don't not... know. Yeah, I don't know if anyone here misunderstands that when we're talking about the, I mean, the books of the law. Uh, the law is is probably a reference to the entire old covenant, which is encapsulated in those five books, right? I mean, no, any. Where the... Where the word Torah is used, it refers to the five books of Moses. Any other thoughts from others? Any? Uh, do you do you find any confusion there? Manil, go ahead. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, you know, uh, I think we have always understood when the uh, Bible uses uh, the law and the prophets and the writings, it is uh, it is clearly or generally understood that the law refers to the Torah, which is the five books of the uh, Bible. So as far as our understanding is concerned, I think there is no confusion. And of course, we can debate why is it we have translated law and not Torah. But as long as we understand that what it means is the five books of the law, that's fine. Okay. That's my understanding. I, I, I don't think we need to just uh, beat it to death. That's my point. Okay. All right. Yeah, that, that was also my understanding. I, I never thought uh, law only is, uh, you know, uh, is, is not reference to the books. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Uh, Suri Murthy, no, not Suri Murthy, but Sikinder seemed to have dropped out. Maybe he's got a bad internet. Praveen, you have any thoughts on that? All right. Okay. Anyway, thanks, Suryamurti. I mean, maybe it makes it much more clearer that uh, we are referring to the books. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I, I look at from Jesus' perspective, and he said the law and the prophets, and obviously he's meaning the entire, you know, covenant inclusive of, you know, all contained in the book. Right. No, no, the law and the prophets, when Jesus says, he refers to the five books of Moses. The law refers to the five books of Moses. Yes. Prophets is a different section. Yes. That's what I thought. <laughs> right. Okay. Any other thoughts on meditation? Uh, did, uh, did, did it help to, I mean, at least, uh, uh, you know, to make that contrast between East, Eastern and Christian meditation? Did it make any sense? Uh, yes. Franklin, you had a thought? Please unmute yourself. Yes, sir. You drew a clear distinction. Na? And then you presented the biblical perspective. In the end, you presented the, what meditation in Christianity means. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm just wondering that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, for some of us, meditation is uh, probably, uh, you know, involuntary and we don't necessarily really, you know, have a structured way of doing it. But if you look at it from a perspective of communion, relational engagement, maybe meditation will be a little bit more, uh, what do you say, uh, will easily come to you. Uh, look at it more from communion and relationship. So, Ramati, go ahead. Uh, you are mentioning that uh, uh, God the Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit commune with each other. I just want to know the reference. Oh, reference. Uh, uh, your, uh, sorry, Murthy, your line is a little uh, choppy, but I'm presuming you're asking uh, uh, where uh, we are talking about uh, Jesus Christ saying that he knows the Father, he keeps knowing the Father, the Father keeps knowing him, there is a union. Is that what you're saying? The line is a little bad there. Praveen, can you uh, see if he's uh... frozen? I think. Oh. Uh, Praveen, you're uh, you're on mute. Uh, Surya Murthy is frozen, and that's the question he asked, as per my understanding also. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's hope that he can come back. But uh, 
for any one of you who might want to know that, uh, I think it is Matthew chapter 11. I mean, that is one verse and John chapter uh, 17. John chapter 17. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, uh, Surimuthi is dropped out. So if you read the last few verses, you will see that. And also John 17, if you read the whole thing, you can see the communion going on between the Jesus and Father. All right. uh, Sikinder, can you hear us? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, were you able to catch some of our discussions? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> okay. Is it, uh, is it uh, addressing a problem and uh, fix it in general sense? Uh, meditation is when we get a problem, we think about it, how to do it and fix it. And on faith lines, we enter it and there is no end for that because we grow in God's grace and knowledge and we'll be studying and meditating upon God's word. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I fully understood your question, but maybe I can say, uh, Sikinda, it is inclusive. Meditation is inclusive. In other words, Yes, you go into a process of meditation even when you are troubled and have difficulty and you're seeking God's guidance uh, and also to be able to get further insight and to draw closer to God and experience his love. So me meditation is, I would think, inclusive in all aspects of life where you are able to connect with and, 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 and what you say, experience the presence of God in your life. Right. And it's a cognitive process. That is that is where I made the distinction between Eastern and Christian. Mm -hmm. Or New Age. You know, New Age is more Eastern, I would think. Cognitive. Right. Oh boy. Yeah, time has moved on. Any other comments or thoughts? <laughs> All right. Well, I, I hope that uh, we spent a, uh, an hour that was useful and maybe you can do a further study on this. But I'm just still hoping that we can uh, experience, uh, you know, uh, what do you say, uh, uh, meditation from the perspective of communion, right? Uh, so we'll just uh, address Surya Murthy's situation and then we'll end. Surimurti, can you hear us? Yes, I got connected again. <laughs> okay. Disconnected. <laughs> right, right. Uh, we were just uh, reflecting on your question. Uh, you were asking about the communion that takes place between father and son, right? I mean, that, that reference. Father, son, and Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you say. Yeah. yeah. See, the whole, the, 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 what do you call it? Uh, the mention of father and son is very clear, but the Holy Spirit proceeds from the father and son. And so obviously, there is a, a very strong connection there. But if you read Matthew chapter 11, the last few verses, uh, and also John chapter 17, you will, you will see very clearly the communion that is taking place, you know, uh, uh, between, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Trinitarian reality. Is that, does, is that helpful? No, I'll read that. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, then, uh, thank you so much for joining us and for your comments. And uh, uh, let's close in prayer then. And like I said, uh, we will have, maybe I'll pick up a few more on spiritual discipline. Uh, and we will then move on to some other topic. Anil, could you lead us in a closing prayer? Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Let's bow our heads. Almighty God in heaven. <clears throat> We come before your mighty throne, Lord, thanking you for all your wonderful blessings that you shower upon us, upon your people, Lord. Oh, God Almighty, we are very grateful for this time that we're able to spend and we're able to fellowship, Father. We please continue to put your presence in these Bible studies, continue to inspire you uh, with your uh, Daniel, with your word, Father, that we may understand, Lord. And today we heard about meditation, Lord. And again, Father, Christian meditation is so different from what others uh, say it is. 
they say about emptying the mind, but we have to fill a mind with you and with the with the Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and with your word, Father. Mm -hmm. So God help us to concentrate on these things and the whole objective being to draw closer to you, to know you more fully and more intimately, Lord. So God teach us your ways that we may live according to your truth. And open thou our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law and incline our hearts to your testimony and not to selfish gain. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for each and everything. Be with us and be with those who have not been able to attend. And we do pray for your well-being on all your people, Lord. Continue to guide us, Lord. Help, help us to be lights in the world. Dismiss us now, Lord. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.